Good evening. This is Strange Love, and I'm your host, Cami Chaos. Welcome, babies. Good evening. Happy Halloween, and welcome to Strange Love Live Tech Edition. I'm your host, Cami Chaos, and as always, I'm joined by Dr. Normal. And this week, our guest is horror author and a uh, woman of many talents, Jamia Jefferson. Hello. Hi, Jamia. How are you? I'm great. Now, I should, I should state for the record... That I've known Jamia since before I think I was old enough to drink. Although I've not seen you <laughs> in like 14 years. <laughs> that definitely happens. Yeah. Kind of a lot. It happens a lot in my circle. Yeah. Yeah. It happens to me a lot. I meet people. So in the years that I didn't see you, you not only wrote one horror book, not two, three, four. But four. Four published vampire novels. That's right. How many have you written? How many books have you written in total? Like, uh, uh, whether or not they were published. How many novel-length works? Yeah. Um, 28. 28? Something like that. Because I'd written 12... I'd written 11 before I left to go to college. Because mm -hmm. I wrote one every six months. Just kind of as a matter of course. Mm -hmm. And... In those days, I was writing them longhand in notebooks, mm -hmm. and uh, they were about six hundred notebook pages a piece. So you've <laughs> so always I'd done known like eleven of those. You've always known that you wanted to write. <laughs> yeah, and no, I mean, when I was a little kid, not really, because you know, as a little kid, I'm just like, I want to be a veterinarian. I'm going to be a cowboy on a space yeah. bed. And then you know, it's like, oh, that's kind of like having to go to medical school, which no, I can't, I can't. I, I, I couldn't deal with the idea of, you know, actually having to actively, you know, knowing that most of my job would be euthanizing animals. And I'm like, I don't think that sounds very fun. Yeah. But I'd always, you know, made up made up stories and the books that I particularly liked. I would I would uh, post commentary in the margins mm -hmm. and it was all generally like sort of like comic reactions to what was happening in the text and you know just having like my own ideas about the ways that that the story could go or like kind of the subtext that i was picking up on and you know i started i wrote a short story when i was 11 i believe mm -hmm. for you know for some school project and everybody just thought it was the greatest thing and i was just like well of course of course it is i'm awesome hello. Yeah. but you know and then i started writing just sort of to entertain myself at that point and it kind of naturally took on you know not really like a like a novel structure just because i'd read i'd read so many books by that point or i actually hadn't read that many books but the books i read i read over and over and over and over again mm -hmm. and so the novel structure really was just kind of like imprinted on me and i just you know didn't really even take it that seriously but so I've been saving you as a guest kind of in my back pocket mm -hmm. ever since I found you on the internets again. Um, I'll hail the internet. Although I could have just asked our Reed because yeah, I only know Reed. And yeah, I, I hardly ever see him either. Yeah. Though, so. But I, I had this like sense that he knew how to find you because he was like, here, read Jimmy's book. And I was like, yeah. oh, thanks, Reed. Mm -hmm. um, because you're a horror author. How many of the massive numbers of books so the four books that you have published mm -hmm. are horror books they are actually they're like horror. they're trampy vampire horror they're 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 psychological erotic works of the dark imagination that's such a with some killings so in them and stuff better explanation yeah because yeah they're not really like ah slashy slashy horror screaming but how many of your stories are horror is that um, kind of those, your go-to genre? Those four novels are, in fact, no. Those are the only yeah. horror novels that I've ever written. Um, and I've written a couple of horror short stories, maybe mm -hmm. like three. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of it. I, I uh, Most of what I write is uh, generally just sort of more pervy. Just more pervy writing? Yeah, it's all just kind of pervy and, you know, just kind of, you know, exploring different, you know, different you know sort of micro obsessions that i have mm -hmm. and uh but i really but i really i, I love vampires mm -hmm. and i've loved vampires since i was very 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 young and so you know it's it's kind of natural that i would that i would try my hand at writing vampire novels just because i i there are things that that I wanted to see in vampire fiction that I wasn't really finding. And I'm like, well, 
I want to read something that's more like what I want to see, so I'd probably better write it myself, and then I write it myself, and I'm like, yay, this is great. So let's, let's before we go any further, let's give everyone the website. It's www, or it's actually just jamia.com. You don't have to have the www. Yes. J-E-M-I-A-H dot com. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can find all four of her books there. You can also find her on Twitter at Jamia J on Twitter. And now I want to find out, you were saying things that you wanted to see from a vampire story. Mm -hmm. So what is your, there are so many different versions of a vampire. Absolutely. And especially since this is the Halloween episode, I think it's important that we dissect what you don't like in the vampire mythology and what your, what your, what your vampire is. Well, um, let's see. Um, there's a couple of different ways to approach that question. Um, there are a lot of things that frustrated me that uh, that either they, a vampire would have a lot of limitations. There are a lot of vampires in, in fiction and, you know, in, in various forms of media and the movies and things. They're really easy to stop. Yeah, they are. You know, I don't know holy why water are so afraid or a cross or sunlight mm-hmm. or, you know. They can't come in your house unless you invite them. And they can't come in them. your house unless you invite them. And I'm yeah. like, well... No, nah, how about they're just different biolog- biological creatures that have these certain that have these certain kind of like criteria, these different sort of like specifications of what their what their kind of different species is. So you're not so more a little closer to the 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 Bram Stoker. So he can be out in the daylight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the the vampires that I wrote about they can. They can go outside during the day, but their their skin is very, very sensitive to sunlight. So they just wear a lot of sunblock and hats mm-hmm. and sunglasses and long sleeves and things. And Like Portland people. Like Portland people, exactly. Right. There is a reason why I live here, <laughs> after all. Um, and uh, in a lot of... And the thing that mainly made me like take matters into my own hands and write the vampire story that I wanted to see is uh, having read a lot of Anne Rice, Mm -hmm. like so many of us did as, you know, teenagers in the, in the eighties, you know, and uh, you know, and I really liked sort of the characterizations and I liked the romanticism of it. And uh, I like the sort of, you know, the, the whole concept of, you know, these, these sort of like doomed people and that they'd been doomed for falling in love more or less, Mm -hmm. but they didn't have sex. And I said, No. That never no. really seemed right to let's me. Let's not only have them have sex, let's make that be the thing that actually binds the vampire and his victim together. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, sort of setting up the sort of like biological criteria by which that by which that process happens, as well as adding in the psychological component of um, being bonded to or you know enslaved to this other creature not both by both by a sort of biological basis but also because the psychological bond is even stronger than anything else that can happen and you know some of the people who are in that situation are are comfortable with it and they celebrate it and some of the people who are in that situation are desperately trying to escape from it and you know it's it's a lot more like actual relationships and so i felt like there was it was a lot more concrete it was a lot more real to me and so the characters and their situations it's very much set in a in a very real world context Mm -hmm. and you know they go they go eat at denny's crazy yeah they're not you know they're they're not out you know in the sort of like you know mist strewn woods or whatever no they're gonna go and eat some fries at denny's and stay up late and go out clubbing and drink too much and then go home and before it gets you know before it gets light and say i really got to stop doing this this is really boring and i've been doing this for 300 years and it's just as boring and it's the exact same scene as Why it's been for 300 stop? years oh well hey it's dark again well what are we gonna do well let's go out let's go to denny's and eat yeah, some fries let's go to denny's and, and have some fries and then let's go out to the clubs and see what's going on and so bringing a lot of my own experiences mm-hmm. to that. But I but I was writing about those experiences long before I actually had them myself because mm-hmm. I I started writing them when I was um, well, I wrote the, the first sort of the first pass of the first of the vampire novels when I was mm-hmm. 18. And the first one is Wounds. The first one is Voice of the Blood, oh. actually. 
Oh, I was skipping the last. You skipping? I'm sorry. No, it's all right. I have them in order, <laughs> and I just totally like had my thumb. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just you know. Um, don't actually listen Vaudible. to me, people. It goes Voice <laughs> of the Blood, which was released in 2001. That's right. And then Wounds in 2002. And then Wounds in And then Fiend in 2005. Mm-hmm. And then A Drop of Scarlet in, in 2007. That's right. And uh, I so I wrote the first draft of, of a Voice uh, Voice of the Blood, you know, having no idea that it would be published or that any or that anyone would read it, actually, mm-hmm. except for myself. Um, so I wrote that when I was 18, and then... You know, several years later, um, after I had, I moved to San Francisco and lived there for a little while and did quite a bit of clubbing there. And it was a very, (laughs) you know, sad, lonely and alienating experience because I couldn't, it was impossible for me to make friends or have any kind of connection with anyone. And I went out, you know, three, four times a week because there's a lot of, there's a lot of goth nights there Yeah, and they were pretty, you know, the music was very good, but there was absolutely no way of being able to make a connection with anybody who was there. And so after having those experiences and going to, you know, some of the most, you know, famous sort of goth nights in the world, and saying, well, there's not really any real place for me in this, but sort of, you know, sort of absorbing these influences and absorbing the the sort of atmosphere of the clubs and seeing that there was a romanticism that was brought to it by the people who, or certainly there, but that I was bringing to it, mm-hmm. that was dashed over and over and over and over again. Every time I went out at the end of the night, I'd just be like, what do I even do this for? And I'd be like, no, I'm go I'm going there because this is the music that I want to hear, and these are you know these are the people who I want to be looking at, but I can't ever actually make a connection with that. And so with you know with those experiences in mind, I then um, moved back to Portland and decided that I was gonna to that I thought, oh well, hey, I've got kind of a hook for that now. I think I'm gonna I, I think I'll actually try writing that now. Yeah, and wrote it and turned out okay and you know really i definitely progressed as a writer by then because i i think i wrote i wrote three novels in the intervening years there was about just like like, a novel machine yeah i (laughs) i write pretty compulsively so and so i you know i'd written a bunch of you know i'd written a whole bunch of things before that you know i'd gone to read Mm -hmm. and gotten a whole bunch more you know sort of like cultural literary influences and also seen a lot more and sort of varied people and it was just like wow you people are all really really messed up okay well all Most right, of people I, I make get that. the best subjects. They, I think that that's <laughs> almost that's that's almost all there is. Yeah. There are very few people out there who are not profoundly messed up. Yeah. The ones that freak me out are the ones that aren't <laughs> profoundly messed yeah, up. Yeah, and uh, some of them are really cool. Yeah, but yeah, a lot of them are just kind of you know, there's really nothing behind the eyes, and you know, I have a hard time relating to them. Yeah. Um, but so i you know when i actually like gave it another try it was you know it it turned out to be a book that i enjoyed for myself very much and again i didn't think that anybody else would ever see it or read it i never i wasn't thinking about publication because you I, were writing I, had, I had been actively discouraged from considering that as a possibility <laughs> That's pretty much my experience through, you know, having taken creative writing classes from, you know, junior high on up to the college level. Pretty much all I heard was give, give up. There's, it's impossible. You can't do it. No matter what. You can't do it. Sorry. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, okay. Well, if I can't do it, I'm not going to bother trying. Cause you didn't just get, like, really angry that they told you you couldn't do something? Well, I got very angry about it, but, if, but it was stated as fact, and I never heard anything anything else that Hmm. that imagined it as something that was actually possible so Mm -hmm. i wrote for my i wrote for my own purposes so how did it how did it get for a book that jamia wrote for jamia Mm -hmm. to okay yeah read this (laughs) it's in print um it's kind of an odd story um I was working at Reed, mm-hmm. you know, having, you know, gotten a, a good gig, you know, doing being a computer technician there. And I was back in touch with my academic advisor, Lisa Steinman, who is a fairly, you know, she's an extremely well-regarded and celebrated poet. Mm-hmm. And her poetry is, you know, it's pretty hard-edged and, you know, it's some good stuff. And she knows a bunch of people. And she came into my office one day 
and uh she was just like do you still write and i'm like yeah and she said do you have any do you have a novel or something that's finished that you'd be willing to show <laughs> somebody and i'm like totally yeah i just finished one a couple of months ago and you know i've edited i've gone through it edited it a couple of times you know i like it and she said well a friend of mine is uh starting a new literary agency and he's having a contest for people to you know send in their novels and you know the 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 first prize winner gets you know like 300 bucks and agency representation i think you should send whatever it is that you have in nice you know entry fee is 10 bucks if you don't have it i'll pay for you and i'm like i've got 10 bucks i mean come on so I, you know, brushed it up, printed it out, and sent it in, and I won first prize. And I was like, oh, oh, okay, cool. Oh, and, and so I was suddenly represented by this guy who was just starting his new literary agency. Mm-hmm. And he happened to be personally acquainted with um, uh, Don Dioria, who ended up being my editor at uh, at Leisure Books, mm-hmm. and he immediately sent my manuscript to Don and said, "I really, you know, you'll probably really like this." And Don immediately liked it. Within a week, turned around and said to Bill, "Well, yeah, we'll take this book." So from me saying, "Yeah, sure, I'll send it in, no big deal," and to saying, "All right, we're we're signing a contract," that was about six weeks. Wow! And I was like, "What?" You're Are you paying me stories. though? Where's my money? I need the money. <laughs> you said you're going to pay me 150 bucks. I really need that money. Mm-hmm. Give it to me now. And they're like, "Yeah, you're you're we're going to get your advance to you pretty soon and that'll be $1500." And I was like, "Yes. Oh Yay. my god. It's the most money I've ever heard of. Yay." Mm-hmm. And then, you know, they and that was in uh 98. I think when that all happened, and so it actually took, it took that long wow. for them to actually release the book. So three years. Yeah, and I—I I mean, it was—it was such a long time between them actually like doing the the purchase of the book and the book actually going to press that I genuinely believed that I had just made up the whole thing because <laughs> I had no indication that it was real, and you know, I wasn't really in touch with the guy who was my agent. Mm-hmm. I wasn't in touch with the guy who was my editor. I'd never heard of the press, and I'm like, I I dreamt that. I must have made it up. It's not real. And then eventually they're just like, all right, here's your galleys. You just go over these and make your corrections, and it'll be in print in a couple months. And I was like, oh, it's real. Who are you? Okay. <laughs> oh. But then it was only a year until the second one was released. And then it was only a year before, because uh, um, when I'd actually met... Um, when I, I met Don, I actually went to New York and, mm-hmm. you know, to visit friends, actually. But, you know, I decided I would go and, and visit Don while I was there. Lovely fellow. Just just adorable. He looks just like the young Paul McCartney. Mm-hmm. And, you know, wears, le- you know, wears a leather jacket. He's <laughs> a little bit, you know, a little bit wry. And uh, really loved the fact that I had a Bella Lugosi quote painted on the back of my leather jacket at the time. And he's just <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And uh, so he's just like, all right, um, do you think you've got another one in, in a series? And I'm like, oh, yeah, totally. And he's like, cool. Well, uh, get started on that now and, you know, show me, you know, show me what you've got. And I'm like, you know, in like a year. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. I'll have it to you in a couple of months. And uh, then I kind of slacked. Like I, I, I can't, like I thought of like a rough concept of something where I wanted to uh, write more about um the very, very charismatic vampire character from the first book, Daniel Bloom. And mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, he really should have his own novel. I could really just talk about what happens to him after the events of the first book. And so I had like a rough idea, you know, kind of wrote it, but then, you know, had started, you know, kind of having a life and things got kind of weird. Stupid and life. Just kind of, you know, sat on it for like, you know, 18 months or so. And so that was like 2000. Mm-hmm. To that, you know, the beginning of that, and I'm just like, oh well, and he's like, well, where's the next book? Are Couple you gonna months. do this? And I'm like, <laughs> oh hell, okay, yeah, I've got it. And so I wrote the, you know, the so I pretty much like completed the manuscript in about four months. Mm-hmm. It's like here you go, because it was such a a very sort of like a singular vision of just uh, of like just unrepentant rage, basically. Like mm-hmm. the second book is just. It's just it's just distilled anger at, um, well, of it, it, like a portrait of people who I've known in my life who um, have been my, you know, my very closest friends mm-hmm. who then 
turned out to be not such good people. Mm -hmm. And so I have, you know, and that's happened to me repeatedly. So I have like several different facets of a personality that I could then, you know, take various elements of what they were like and the feeling of being in that friend relationship with them and, you know, sort of constructed a character out of it. And, um, you know, just just being really just fed up with capitalism in America and, you know, the art world and New York City and, you know, everything that everybody is supposed to be. And so I just kind of you know said, well, let's just write a really nasty, evil sort of like hate letter to everything, mm-hmm. you know, turned that in. And they're just like, great, this looks fine. Fantastic. You and, hate uh, the world. Yes, yeah, so I hated that. that mm-hmm. And uh, then uh, I finished that book on... August 30th, 2001. And, uh, you know. It was out less than a year later. Mm-hmm. And wow. then it was out less than a year later. And, uh, so two weeks after I had finished that book, which is set in New York City, mm-hmm. and, uh, the subject matter is essentially, like, art terrorism for fun. <laughs> Two weeks later, some people fly some planes into the World Trade Center building, and I was just like, I brought this on! This is all my fault! This book is never getting published. And so I called my editor, and I'm just like, Don, is everything okay? And he's like, uh, yeah. What are you talking about? And I'm just like, I think the subject matter is a little close to it. And he's like, nobody's gonna care about that. Nobody's gonna put those things together. Don't worry about it. I'm just like, okay. And I'm glad you're fine. He's like, yeah, I could, I could see it. I could see uh, it from I could see it from my office, but yeah, I'm all good. Yeah. yeah. So it was a very str- and so then like many so it took a couple more years after that before I was able to come up with another story in the series, but it was a very strange couple of years there. And me and in the meantime my my agent disappeared off the face of the earth basically. I still don't know where he is. Bye-bye mysterious agent. Yeah. So it was all very, it's all very odd. Yeah. So it just, you know, kind of return to trying to sort of mentally return to writing books for myself. Yeah. Rather than writing have them you written, How many books have you written since these four? Since um, the last one? I wrote um, an online serialized web novel or mm-hmm. wobble, for, wobble for Underland <laughs> Press. Um, I love how we just put... Wah in front of everything. Wah, well, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, so I wrote that from October or so through April of this year. Mm-hmm. And so, so October 08 to April 09. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's not strictly, I mean, it, I was I was trying to structure it, you know, and it can't, it doesn't have the same structure as a novel because it's it was weekly installments. It's a webisode, yeah. And um, also uh, the readers got to vote on where the where the plot would go mm-hmm. each week, and so oh, every week I had to adventure I had to scramble to catch up with whatever it was that the that the readers wanted, mm-hmm. and so that was written in, and I basically had one day each week to write each chapter. So um, it's not exactly how I how I write in general. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I'm when I'm writing, I I just go like gangbusters and I write every single night and you know, I'm working on the story every single spare minute that I have as opposed to having to wait until I hear back from the readers to then and then have to like slam out th- 3000 words in a day yeah. and make sure that it's good. So eventually I would like to uh, get that edit, uh, re-edited into a more traditional novelistic structure mm-hmm. and have that come out in print sometime. But it's probably going to be a little bit longer before I can actually work on that. So so we're squeaking up against November now. Mm-hmm. Are you a NaNoWriMoer? No. No? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, could pro- I could do it. Mm-hmm pretty easily i imagine just because i write very quickly Mm -hmm. but no i don't really i don't i don't like having an external structure imposed Mm -hmm. on the writing because that makes it just it makes it not pleasurable for me to do i'm so becomes work i'm so busy with everything else that the only time i have ever written that much in one period of time was Mm -hmm. not last year but the year before that when i did nanowrimo and finished oh nice but and and my husband then went and printed my my Aww. book out for me and everything, and I've got it there. And he was like, "And you can edit it, sweetie." And I'm like, oh, "I 
I can't get past <laughs> chapter two. I'm like, yeah, that was like blood and guts, but I'm, uh-huh. I think I'm going to try it again this year. It's, 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 it's a good boot so camp. It, it, it does force you to be productive. Yeah. And Whether forces... you like what you produce or not, it does force you to get out exactly. there and do it. Exactly. And that's kind of like what the writing the Wavel was like, except for that it was six months in duration and I could only write for one day a week. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it, it makes you very, very efficient, but, um, I've, I've vast, I mean, as fast as I was able to write when I was younger, I mean, writing 600 pages every six months by hand, I used to write by hand for about 16 hours a day, seven yeah. days a week. Cause I, you know, I would write while I was in school because I wasn't I was paying kid, attention. <laughs> I did poetry. Much easier. You can fill notebook upon notebook with poetry. Mm-hmm. Much less hand cramping. It's true. Because, you know, you just finish at the end of the line. You don't mm-hmm. have to go. <laughs> exactly. I didn't have, I didn't get hand cramps then. I can't write by hand. Oh, for... really? You didn't get the, like, the finger knots? Oh, I do. I mean, this, this hand is much more gnarled than mm-hmm. the other. I mean, as a, as a comparison, the left hand versus the right hand. Mm-hmm. The, the mm-hmm. pinkies are, are much more kind of deformed, and then mm-hmm. the writing callus is finally starting to wear down on this yeah, finger a little bit. I don't have those anymore, bit. but my fingers are not so sensitive on the pads because I type so dang much. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, no, even with that level of, and because I'm, you know, I'm obviously thinking about and, you know, crafting what I'm doing a little bit more deliberately now, I still think I'm, I'm at this point, I can write faster than I did then because, of course, I can type a lot faster than I could ever write yeah. by hand. So, um, I was writing, uh, I have been writing a lot of fan fiction for most of the last two years, and at my, at my most productive, I was averaging about 10,000 words a week, every week, for at least, for at least a year, I was doing about 10,000 words a week. That is productivity. It was awesome. And good stuff, too. We need to start wrapping it up to head into after hours, but I want to get, aside from your vampires, your top three vampires... And then maybe you're um, like the ones, oh, that's the, so maybe hard. the two that you hate the most. Oh, mm. so top three and two that you hate the most. Um, well, the two that I hate the most. Well, can I say Edward Cullen for both of the two that I hate the most? You can't hate him twice. You can pick a second <sighs> character from the series. Uh, name anyone. <laughs> name any name anyone from the Twilight series, and yeah, they'll they'll take the the bottom slots. So any any Twilight vampire, absolutely. Okay, absolutely and anything. Top three. Top three. Did um, you read the entire series? I haven't read any of them. Then how can you hate them? Because it's wrecking my life. Uh, okay, that's fair. <laughs> um, I've I had to see the movie, <clears throat> so I yeah. didn't advise that. Um, yeah, I, uh, it, well, it wasn't my choice. <laughs> the movie um, was, I'm very The movie was really it. bad, but I'm dumb enough. I'm going to watch the second one because I want to know if it's just as bad as the first one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you go ahead with that, dear. Yeah. Um, I can't I will, help I it. won't be there for you. <laughs> I understand. I'll tell you how much it sucks, though. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll, okay. I'll take that. Top, um, top three. Top three. I love Spike. Oh. I love me some Spike. He's my favorite. I think he's really he's special. He's my favorite vampire ever. I, I adore him. Um... I do really like me some Dracula. Mm-hmm. I like good. all incarnations of Dracula mm-hmm. ac- across the board in okay. every single form of media I've seen him in. I love Dracula. Okay. And, um, hmm. I kind of would like to mention one of the the Anne Rice vampires, but all of them became all they of them were character together. assassinated yeah. a- eventually because Armand is fantastic in in the Vampire Lestat. Armand is fantastic, but yes. yeah, they wrecked him eventually. Yeah. Um, who else is good? Oh, um, Ellie from Let the Right One In. I Ellie. I have to make notes. I have no idea. Oh, you have to. You okay. have Let to. Right it is in. probably the best vampire movie that's ever been made. Okay, I'm gonna. It's absolutely breathtaking. <clears throat> and when we take the break, so I'm just gonna romantic. go put that up on that. That's really romantic movie, okay. in a way that just it's beautiful and you know extreme. See, very I low learned budget, something. I very learned low something budget, new. very beautiful. It will you know wrap up warmly while you watch it because you know it's Swedish. Okay, it's you know, in the winter. You know my chosen Afghan wrapping. I mm-hmm. will. Yeah, have have some hot tea and have somebody to hug afterwards because you're just going to want to hug and kiss somebody. Okay. I'm just like, 
love. It's so beautiful and so terribly messed up in a lot of ways. Okay. okay. Um, before we go, Jamia.com. Jamia.com. And Jamia J on Twitter. And we'll see you guys in After Hours. Thank you so much for joining us. Excellent.